Lecture 20, Self-Optimizing Software. Our previous discussion about compiler optimizations and its converse, optimizing the compiler, was focused on things that the compiler could do at compile time. But what about runtime? Well, that's hard for the compiler. A sufficiently smart compiler uh, can really make your program a lot better, but it's going off of only the information that is available at the time that the compilation is taking place. However, a smart program can change itself at runtime to be better. Better in this case meaning faster. You know, when you optimize software and reduce its time and, you know, the laws of time are mine. There's a lot we could do, um, and what changes would we make? Well, we'll start with some simple things, and we'll move on to more complex things and things that are harder to get right. Uh, the simple stuff has to do with just changing what's in memory, and we'll advance into changing the configuration, and then finally we'll think about changing binary code itself. Um, all right, so your first thought about how a program might change its behavior at runtime for speed might be something like caching. If you keep track of the most popular exchange rates in memory, so they're faster uh, at the ready than they would be if you had to go get them from the database, that would, in some sense, change the behavior of your program versus the unmodified program that has no such cache. And management of that cache will take place at runtime, as it couldn't be really managed at compile time. I mean, you could maybe seed it with some uh, starter stuff, but management of it would certainly take place at runtime. Uh, and it will adapt over time uh, based on the patterns of usage. If today the exchange rate for Canadian dollar to euro is popular, it'll appear in the cache. Uh, and without any code changes, if for some reason the Canadian dollar to British pound exchange rate becomes popular, it will go in the cache and be faster to access. You do technically get different behavior. Um, but that's not quite what we wanted to talk about today. It's too easy. Ha! You just heard someone tell you that caching was easy. You know, it's uh, known to be a hard problem. No, uh, I mean, I don't think that you know, cache eviction on its own is easy, but if the goal is just speeding up your program and you know, doing that with a cache, uh, there isn't a lot to discuss there. There's not a lot to mine. So... I wouldn't really have anything to tell you, and, you know, we'd be finished here in three minutes, so we don't have a, you know, closing credit sequence where I, you know, thank all my Patreon subscribers, but if I did, then, you know, that would be it. You know, roll credits. No, um, we gotta do something uh, a little more interesting than that. All right, so the first thing that we'll talk about for real, I call Observe and Change. Uh, and the idea is your program's configuration changes at runtime based on observed behavior. If there are multiple routes to the same outcome, we might choose at runtime which one of those is correct. This is effective because our initial guess might not be that great, um, but also because conditions can change at any time. The circumstances under which we made the decision where we said, yeah, we should totally do it this way, could be very different uh, at runtime six months later. Like we don't, we don't know when the program is going to execute or for how long. And you know, certainly there are programs that execute for months at a time. Um, I mean, if uh, if you've taken uh, EC two fifty two with me um, for one of the exercises slash assignments, there's a remote server, uh, and that server has been running for the last I don't know, two years or something at the time when I'm. Uh, maybe it's not quite two years at the time of recording, but something like that. So if there were some configuration in there, uh, who's to say that decisions that I made uh, when I wrote it in time for the first offering of the course uh, are valid now? So initial conditions or actual conditions uh, can vary quite a lot. Um, if you wanted me to put an example of that, though, think about databases. If you took a course in databases, I hope it contained at least a small component in which you talked about query processing, uh, and it wasn't just, you know, here's how to write a select query, and here's how to write a join query. But when you submit your request to the database uh, using SQL, it is the kind of programming language where you specify the form of the result you want, and it's the responsibility of the database server to carry that out. 
And therefore, to do so, the database server is going to analyze it and decide on an execution plan. Uh, and so if your query, you know, select ID from blah, blah, join something, where, conditions, all of those things, um, then there are potentially several options. So for any sufficiently complicated query, there might be several valid routes for how to execute it. Um, and so you know, it doesn't mean you know they're all equal. Some of them might be better than others. Um, but you know, as far as the, the database server is concerned, it needs to make a decision and it will choose one of the plans uh, and it will guess about which one it thinks is the best. You know, there are estimates uh, and costs affixed to different operations and it'll say, well, I think if I do this in this order, that will have the lowest cost and will therefore be done the fastest. Okay. However, a server could at least once, try out one of the different strategies and note if it's if it actually is better than the original version. All right? When you're asking it to estimate, it says, I think that root A takes, we'll say just for the sake of an example, 1,000 units, and I think root B takes 1,100 units, where units are how it measures cost. You can uh, think of that however the database server prioritizes. Um, but it might actually find that its estimate for A is an underestimate, so it's more than 1,000, and its estimate for B is an overestimate, so uh, the uh, actual value is less than 1,000. And if it ever tried B, it would say, hey, actually, Actually, this is better. So a lot of queries happen many times, or at least are very similar to already observed queries. You know, select employee from database where ID equals 42 is not that different from you know, select uh, employees uh, data from that same table, but the ID is now 99. So why not just give it a try? Remembering what worked might actually be helpful. Um, building on that, a database server can change how it stores data based on observed patterns of usage, right? Um, you know, it organizes the data, how it's stored on disk based on the patterns. And you can really do the same thing in your program. If you want an analogy, um, I can sort, say, an Excel sheet that has final exam grades, which may or may not have been something I did in between uh, recording the last video and recording this one. Uh, and you can sort that by either student ID or by user ID. Student ID being, you know, the numeric version and user ID being what you log in on uh, based on whichever one I need. So if it's during the term and I'm entering grades, uh, I probably use student ID, that sort of thing. Um, that would make it relatively easy. And uh, student ID is also what I need for uploading everybody's grades to Quest. So sorting it on that is helpful. However, um, I could always change the organization after it makes sense. So if it's after the end of term, um, people might email me and they might say, oh, can you tell me how I did on the final? Uh, and sure, I can, uh, but usually they email me you know, from their uWaterloo email account without specifying their student ID number. So I can look at that, I can say, ah, you know, your student ID is not known to me, but your user ID is, and so my uh, search in the table uh, would be based on your user ID. And the same thing could happen uh, when you are thinking about storing files on disk. Um, not really any different than from how a database might store some data, uh, that if you find you are using something as an index for looking it up, then by all means organize the file in that way, it will be more efficient. So in, in any way, you cut it. Uh, if you change your strategy based on observed behavior, you could potentially get some faster results because you're storing the data in a way that's consistent with the way it's going to be used. Uh, you can apply this observe and change strategy as well to invocation of external services. And by external, I mean like things over the internet where you are calling a remote service. Um, and if you think about it, and there are, say, three different servers in an example where we can send messages, you could measure and remember how long it took to get a response from that server. Keeping in mind that you know, this includes the travel time, uh, but also how long it took for the server to actually fulfill your request. By default, if you were just picking one, you would say, all right, well, maybe I'll choose the server that is closest geographically. 
right? That seems like it might be a good idea. Um, in fact, if all servers would take about the same amount of time to process the response, uh, then uh, the only really variable thing would be transport time over the network, uh, in which case choosing the closest one is the best. However, test this assumption. It may be the case that the closest server is very heavily used, uh, and therefore it takes a long time to get an answer from it. It might actually take less time, you know, real wall clock time, to get an answer from a server that's less busy but farther away. And if you were designing a system where there were a lot of such requests, you might say, well, I'm going to remember which one is the fastest, at least according to my data, uh, and I'll send eight out of every ten messages to that server, and one each to each of the other two servers. Uh, and I might discover by doing that that my current guess at the fastest server is wrong, and it's better to decide which one is the primary one where we're going to send most of our data. Now, of course, you don't have to make it 8 out of 10. Um, 8 out of 10 is really just an example for um, how much share you want it to put. You could, you could make it you know, 98 out of 100 uh, that you send to your main server uh, and just a couple uh, to the other ones. Or you could send a few to the other ones just to make sure it's not an outlier. You've got your choice. Um, I give you know, only round numbers for the sake of an example. Uh, and to highlight the idea that if there are multiple servers, you could check it out and see which one really is the fastest at any given moment. Moment, remembering that that can change. Recently, uh, as of the time of recording, uh, you may have read an article uh, about a, an outage uh, in the U.S. East One region of AWS, uh, which, uh, if if you had chosen uh, to put a server there uh, for your external service, and all of your clients were looking for that location only, uh, or you know, all the ones in the U.S. were looking for that location only, then you might have had a bad time. Uh, whereas figuring out actually that other servers uh, in other regions might be faster uh, would work too. Okay, the uh, next strategy that I want to talk about is genetic algorithms. Uh, and if you've taken an advanced course on algorithms, you might know about this, and uh, I suppose it's entirely possible you've taken a full course on it, uh, or at least a significant chunk of one. I'm not going to uh, try to replace that. There's a lot more detail to genetic algorithms than we're going to talk about right now. Um, this is just to give you a high-level explanation of how you could apply it to the kind of problem that we are interested in. Um, and the idea behind a genetic algorithm is that it's inspired by natural selection. I'm going to give you a quick it's three-ish paragraph explainer on genetic algorithms just so you understand what we're talking about. And I'm not going to give you a you know, complicated homework assignment that says look this up just so you can understand um, the minor point that I want to make here. So the idea is inspired, as I say, by natural selection. That is to say that uh, our program is trying to solve a particular problem. This is sometimes like designing an antenna. Uh, in, in uh, a standard example, um, and a number of candidate solutions are created, uh, and your initial conditions are possibly random uh, and evaluated for their fitness, uh, fitness being how well do they solve the problem. Solutions with a higher fitness have a higher chance of continuing forward into the next group of candidates, that's the next generation. No, uh, no Captain Picard necessary. Um, and at each generation, good solutions from previous generations are combined, if possible, and or mutated randomly to see if that made it better or worse. Uh, and this process will repeat until either a sufficiently optimal solution has been found or a fixed number of generations have been evaluated. And it resembles uh, the Darwin-esque idea of natural selection uh, in that solutions with good qualities move forward in the simulation. You could say in quotation marks, they reproduce. Uh, that's anthropomorphizing the Product, uh, the uh, program a little bit. I mean, you know, they don't reproduce in the sense that, like, you know, a successful solution in the next generation is not uh, the child of a, a solution in the previous one, but it was a slight modification of what existed before. Um, and those with bad qualities die out. Uh, that is, we don't continue to evaluate them because they're already known to be worse than solutions that we already have. Uh, and if we execute this process well, then you end up with a solution that ends up being good overall, you know, has high fitness, um, or is at least 
good enough. There are a couple requirements for that, though. Uh, this requires some parameters to configure, of course. Uh, if there's nothing to configure, there's nothing that could change, and you wouldn't know whether or not a solution is better than any other because they're all the same. Um, you also need some sort of fitness function, a way of evaluating how well is the solution in question solving the problem. Uh, and that function can't be binary in the sense of like pass fail because it doesn't say whether a solution A is better or worse than solution B. Uh, so you actually want something that is you know, continuous or in the mathematical sense discrete, um, where you have uh, you know the ability to say solution A with the score of 84.1 is better than solution B with a score of 81.0. Um, and fitness could be evaluated on multiple criteria. It could be on you know, accuracy in solving the problem. It could be on time in solving the problem. You could balance those two, something like that. Uh, you know, the best solution in the most reasonable amount of time, you choose. The other thing that you have to worry about a little bit is that the fitness function might find a local maximum as opposed to a global one. Uh, because if you are converging on a particular solution, you might find one that is in fact better than any you know, simple variant of that solution, uh, but is not the best possible solution if every kind of thing could be considered. So genetic algorithms don't necessarily guarantee you the best possible outcome, hence the idea of, you know, it's good enough. Um, and you know, with that in mind, you, know, you are evaluating potentially a very large number of solutions, uh, and um, this could take a long time. If you're talking about you know, evaluating whether or not this configuration change makes your program run better or worse, um, if you have a program that runs a lot and does a lot of processing, you might know that pretty quickly. Um, but for other programs, you might have to say, well, uh, I'm going to wait and see you know, what is the behavior of the program over an hour average week to determine whether it was you know, more or less uh, you know, good as a solution. Uh, if you are uh, evaluating database load or something, you, know, you, you can probably evaluate that in the short term if you have a lot of database requests, but maybe you get a lot of database requests you know, on certain days of the week only, uh, in which case you got to wait for that day of the week to come around to really know how well it worked or didn't. Okay, so genetic algorithms do what? Uh, I, you, know, you are probably thinking, you know, how do? Okay, that sounds great. You know, nice theory, you know, cool story, bro. But how do I actually apply that in a program that I'm working on? Um, and here's a, here's an idea. If you think back to a previous discussion about Google Maps. We didn't really come to uh, a solid conclusion about how Google Maps works, but you could imagine that it might make decisions based on certain parameters. And by parameters, I mean things like this. So number of routes to evaluate, you know, do we try 10 possibilities and give you the best one, or should it be 7, or should it be 15, or, or should it be 3? Uh, we don't know a heuristic for generating routes to evaluate. So you might have something that says, well, you, you don't want to choose a route that gets you farther away from the target. But actually, as we know, that might sometimes be better because going to a highway, even though it's not necessarily uh, starting off in the direction you intend to go, that might actually be faster. Um, decay of traffic information reported by other motorists. I mean, if, if a road is very busy, you will have lots of motorists on there and they have Google Maps installed and you'll get some data out of that. Um, but if something is relatively lightly traveled, you, know, you could uh, put a decay factor on there that says, okay, well, uh, we understood earlier it was slow, but now it seems to be better. Um, other things that go into generating a solution might be time of day uh, and time of month and whether or not today is a holiday or not. And you might expect traffic is lighter on some holidays, but heavier on others. Uh, you know, if it's the kind of holiday where people get together and you know, spend time with their family, then traffic might be lighter. Um, but if it's the kind of holiday where people are like, yeah, I'm going to go kick it uh, on the beach at the cottage kind of thing, that might actually mean there's increased traffic. Uh, and there might also be a configuration parameter for just the search radius for alternate routes. You know, how far are we going to search uh, just outside of our actual you know, intended area? Uh, you know, this could be smaller, it could be bigger, uh, but it might make a significant difference in whether or not a particular route is suggested or not. Now, listen, this is Google, so they probably consider many different things. You know, they've got 
an incredible amount of data um, about you, traffic, everything. You know, it's kind of disturbing in that regard. Uh, and I'm, I'm not warranting that this is at all how Google actually does it. However, if you have a system in which there are configuration parameters, choosing those configuration parameters by hand is very difficult. Uh, and letting a genetic algorithm choose values based on experimenting and trading off the quality of the solution against the time to come up with it might actually be very helpful. Um, that might give you better results than people would come up with by hand. Um, we might consider you know, a solution that only comes up with roots that you know, are terrible to be a failure. We would say this is not a fit solution. We don't like it. Unacceptable. Uh, even if those answers are ready immediately. Uh, and we might consider uh, a successful solution, the one that comes up with you know, a good route uh, or nearly optimal route in the shortest time. That might be the most important thing for Google. And one of the reasons why genetic algorithms might be a good choice for this kind of problem is that the problem's nonlinear. And by nonlinear, I mean you can't treat each parameter as an independent variable and change just you know, expecting that one of them will um, have some you know, direct output result. Um, if, um, if you have a nonlinear system, changing one thing changes a lot of things and it's very hard to trace that you know, changing uh, one thing results directly in a certain output. Uh, there's interaction of variables with one another. Um, if you change the search radius, then that has an impact on what routes are suggested outside of uh, just where they might be because you know, with the number of routes to evaluate, you will be thinking of you know, maybe more routes that involve main roads and fewer routes that involve back roads. It's, it's hard to know. So uh, for that reason, uh, genetic algorithms uh, are sometimes very good for this kind of problem. Okay, um, you might be thinking that this takes away some of the mystery of genetic algorithms, and maybe you're also thinking that this isn't really self-optimizing software. We're just optimizing configuration parameters. Well, let's go up a level. Okay, I guess I really mean down, but you know, let's increase the difficulty and we'll think about changing the binary itself. Okay, in our previous discussion of compiler optimizations, we talked about a number of things a compiler can do to make the program more efficient. And we know that some of them are always a win. Uh, skipping constant multiplication or something is easy. Or uh, jumping over a dead code. Uh, yeah, obviously, you know, <laughs> no one would say no, don't do it. However, um, sometimes an optimization is questionable. And questionable in the sense is that like, you can't be guaranteed that it is going to be an improvement. It might be, it might not be, uh, and it will really depend on the situation. The compiler will do an analysis, it will make its best guess, but it could be wrong. So inlining is a perfectly good example of this. We spent a lot of time talking about inlining uh, in particular because it's a place where you can give some directions to your compiler and say, I want this or I don't want this. Um, and the thing is about that kind of decision is it's usually permanent. If the compiler decides it's inlining this function, the function is inlined and the generated binary has that function inlined and that's how it works and that's how it will be always and forever. On the other hand, there's the JVM. If you're writing a uh, you know, JVM language, Java, Kotlin, something like that. Um, okay, this, uh, this gives us a little bit more opportunity for things to change at runtime. Um, now, this, this Java joke, I think, never gets old. But basically, um, what do we notice? There's the just-in-time compiler, uh, and there's the Java Virtual Machine, uh, and we can see some optimizations in both of those places that will change what happens. I mean, when your program is compiled in Java, like you, know, you run Java C, it generates actually the intermediate representation, the, the Oracle version of it, um, and... Um, then there's a second chance to uh, make some decisions about what to do here at runtime. Um, Oracle's documentation actually says that there are two different 
uh, GAIT, just in time, compilers. Uh, one of them is for clients and one for servers. And the client one runs faster, but is slightly less efficient. Uh, and the server one takes more time and more resources, and it produces slightly better code. Uh, I don't have uh, facts and figures at hand about, you know, is there a meaningful difference between the two? Uh, but evidently, somebody thought there would be because they made two different ones. Uh, and this is uh, more helpful in some scenarios than others, right? Um, the, the major advantage is that there are runtime decisions about what happens. Uh, and so if we have decided to inline something and that turns out to be a bad idea, we could just not inline it anymore, right? Okay, there's a little bit of complexity to it, but that's something we could do. Uh, for other scenarios like branch prediction, it is less helpful. Um, being able to change our decision there is still valuable, but the hardware will probably save us if our prediction and software is not very good. Uh, the uh, branch prediction hardware in the CPU will recognize that, you know, oh, this, this branch is taken uh, and will react accordingly. But uh, yeah, we could, well, we could expect that the, uh, that the runtime will identify things that it can do and apply them where it thinks it will be beneficial. Um, there are more things than this than uh, just the idea of you know swapping in the uh, inlined code versus making it a function call. Um, we can actually look at three other things that are noteworthy. Escape analysis, on stack replacement, and intrinsics. Uh, and these are just-in-time compiler things that are really not practical at compile time, but could be done at runtime. All right, so the first one is escape analysis, uh, or I suppose if you ask Dory, escape analysis. Um, and the question that the just-in-time compiler wants to ask is, are there any side effects visible outside of a given method? Again, that's something that compilers will try to do and uh, rust will discourage you from having side effects and functional programming languages really don't want you to have side effects but you may um, and if there are no side effects visible outside a method there are a couple of shortcuts that we could take uh, one is that some things that should get heap allocated actually won't be and they will be stack allocated instead So we don't have to go through the process of heap allocation and initialization and everything We can just say yep, we're going to stack allocate this uh, And you know, then it will automatically get tossed when we uh, return from this function That sounds strange because again if you've taken a course with me in C I'm constantly telling people to please heap allocate things because you know, they occasionally encounter problems by stack allocating things and not understanding why it doesn't work the way it's supposed to work but the compiler can do it if it's sure that it is a good idea uh, another thing you can do is lock elysium that is don't use a lock if there's no need for one um, in Java, you indicate something is uh, you know, locked, synchronized, using the synchronized keyword, uh, either on a method or a block, uh, and that means it can only ever get called from one thread at a time. Um, but um, if the just-in-time compiler can determine that a lock serves no purpose, you know, that there's no possibility that it gets invoked concurrently, then uh, it will just not bother with the lock. And there being no lock at all, there's no setup time, there's no acquisition costs, anything like that. Uh, and there's also lock coarsening. Uh, and this is, in some sense, the opposite of advice we gave earlier, where we said make your critical sections smaller uh, and uh, try to avoid having things, uh, having things be uh, in the critical section that don't need to be. Um, but in the case of lock coarsening, then, well, what the compiler will do is say that actually if there are sequential blocks that are using the same lock, the compiler will combine them so it cuts down on the overhead for locking and unlocking uh, to make it happen. Uh, and one last thing I'll uh, squeeze in there alongside that are nested locks. That is, if the same lock is acquired repeatedly without releasing, so there's like recursive code or something, uh, then the compiler will uh, combine that so we don't have quite as much overhead lost to locking and unlocking. 
on stack replacement. Uh, also, uh, tagline here, I know a shortcut. Um, this is a way the virtual machine can change implementations of a particular method. Um, and so this can happen if a function is identified as important, uh, also referred to as hot, uh, in that it runs frequently. Um, and so if we see that, we just swap in a more optimized version. There is a certain cost to that, right? Um, the virtual machine has to pause execution briefly and swap in the new stack frame because it could be organized a little bit differently than the original. Um, but it will be of benefit in the long run if this function is truly a frequently executed piece of code. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, a more optimized version, if it's at the ready, could be swapped in rather easily there. If you've done debugging in a uh, JVM language, Java, Kotlin, something like that, uh, you may have observed that if you have the debugger attached, you can sometimes swap in frames with some new code. Uh, and that is very helpful um, if it works. It doesn't always work. Uh, you know, the JVM will tell you hot swap succeeded or hot swap failed, and it will tell you how many classes it replaced. Um, if it works, it allows you to try with a changed version of the program without having to stop and restart. Uh, if it fails, then, well, you have to stop and restart uh, because the executing binary code didn't change. Um, if there's a long workflow to reproduce a particular problem, then it's great if you can actually take advantage of this. If, uh, however, you know, that's not the case, uh, but the application takes a long time to start, uh, you will also be very grateful for the ability to swap out these frames so, so that you don't have to keep waiting for it to start up every time you make a tiny little change. Believe me, I've been there. Uh, and the third thing I want to talk about is intrinsics. And intrinsics is a form of preparation in advance. Uh, and it is a highly optimized version of code that is pre-compiled for a specific platform. Uh, that is to say that you have you know, taken, uh, taken note of the fact that a particular operation is important uh, and a particular architecture is important. You've said, all right, I'm going to create a native implementation of it, one that really doesn't use the JVM. And it's just, we've got I don't know, a pre-compiled uh, assembly segment that we could drop in, uh, well, pre-compiled binary segment that we could drop in when we need. These were originally developed in C++, um, which I guess kind of makes C++ Java's unsafe mode, um, but uh, that's no longer necessary. Uh, there's a different approach called Graal, G-R-A-A-L, uh, which turns Java bytecode directly into machine code. Um, thing is, intrinsics are hard to write, uh, and it is actually a fairly complicated process to get an intrinsic added, um, but it is recognized that when there is a particularly important operation, having a pre-compiled, pre-optimized version of it might actually be very helpful. Um, so uh, they might be a little bit controversial, um, and... Uh, they serve their purpose, so it's it's good that we have them. All right, so this hotspot approach is perhaps closest to what you might have imagined by reading the title of the topic, right? Um, I said we're going to change the uh, the binary code based on the observed runtime behavior of the program, um, but the thing is that uh, Rust doesn't have you know, the hotspot JVM. Uh, it doesn't have the just-in-time compiler. Decisions made at compile time will stand. Unless, I mean, there is a trade-off here, right? Uh, the JVM uh, comes with its own overhead, um, and Rust skips that, uh, and you know, this this can be very good. However, uh, not being able to reverse a compile time decision might be a minus. Unless, okay. Um, so rewriting the binary in a language like C or Rust can happen, but it requires uh, a lot of uh, steps we have to do ourselves and or dark magic. I mean, at this point, I don't think we should be like really afraid of dark magic because you know we can uh, we can wield it responsibly. I hope, um, but it is nevertheless uh, something that uh, wouldn't make sense in every circumstance. 
Now, um, what we're going to do resembles the Java intrinsics approach as uh, you know, one way of going about this, uh, and that is we prepare in advance different versions of a compiled block of code. Uh, and so when the program is being built, we're saying make several variants with different optimization decisions or other trade-offs. We'll start with the default, and if we determine based on what we observe, uh, that we need to make a change, we can overwrite that part of the binary in memory with the new version, and voila, we have changed the code path that executes. Swapping it in at runtime um, is not necessarily super easy uh, because we have to be sure that you know, that code is not being executed uh, at the time when we're going to change it, but all right, you know, there are worse problems to have. Uh, there, there does have to be at least a little bit of coordination to make sure that uh, this is going to work as expected. Um, but then you might ask yourself, now wait a minute, why not just if statements? I mean, this approach does increase compile time. That's usually of minor concern. Uh, the, the amount of extra time to compile those extra functions is probably negligible in the grand scheme. Uh, but we do have to think about how many different variants uh, we want to have um, and how you want them to look, uh, which ones make sense and which ones don't. There's uh, some some work and some thought that needs to go into that in the beginning. Um, and that's still at compile time, and we are still guessing. Uh, the only thing that's really different now is we get multiple guesses instead of one. All right, that is potentially an improvement, assuming, you know, all of our guesses are reasonable, then probably one of them is likely to be the best. Uh, and that's going to give us an opportunity to make some changes at runtime to use the latest stuff based on what we've observed. However, you could also say, well, wait a minute, um, you know, if I just have different if statements in the program, um, we would just, you know, go to the right place based on whatever parameters we have observed, and we don't have to you know, overwrite a section of the binary. We're just calling, you know, a different function that uh, has a similar name uh, and a similar implementation, but isn't the exact same one, and we don't have to overwrite anything at all, do we? I mean, can we just decide at runtime which function to call? Um, I think in most cases the answer to that is yes. So, um... We haven't really achieved our goal of doing it truly dynamically. So let's increase the difficulty again. So you want to compile some code. With all the understanding that you have at this point of uh, all the things a compiler does, I'm going to assume that you don't want to write your own compiler and include it in your program. Code generation is not magic, it's not so incredibly difficult that you can't do it, but uh, if you want to make optimal code, you need a lot of the analytics and decision making that's in the compiler, and the people who wrote the compiler already did a good job of it, so why reinvent that particular wheel? Why not just make use of the compiler that's already on the system that you are working with? Right? Just use the existing compiler. So that's the realistic approach, um, and that may mean if you're requiring a specific compiler to be on your system, um, you might be limiting your ability to actually employ this technique. If it's end-user software and you know, you're giving it to people who run Windows, they might not have a compiler installed at all because they never needed to. Well, I, I suspect very strongly that my parents have never had a compiler installed uh, on any of the computers that they use uh, because why would they need it? What would it do? What is its purpose? Um, so that might be a limitation. By that same token, you might have limitations about which compiler is available. You know, if you're counting on LLVM uh, and the target machine has uh, only GCC installed, that could be a slight problem as well. Um, in fact, uh, in that regard, uh, if you uh, encounter uh, you know, deploying it on somebody else's server, they might have a security policy that forbids the installation of a compiler uh, to make it harder for any exploit to compile and run a payload. You know, that would be a thing as well. But let's pretend that um, none of those things are at issue. Uh, you have a compiler, it is the right one, it is available on the target system, uh, and then we are in business. Uh, and the approach is simple to explain, even if it's difficult to actually carry out. 
Uh, and it is first take the uh, binary code of the segment that we want uh, to optimize and ask the compiler, hey, what do you think of this? The compiler will take the binary and convert it to the internal representation. That's the intermediate representation that we've talked about before. Uh, and then try to optimize it and then try to compile it. Once that's happened, you've got you know, a new binary code uh, segment ready, and then you can swap it in again by uh, coordinating when we're going to overwrite some stuff uh, and then actually overwriting it so that the actual binary file is changed to include the new stuff. Sounds good. Does it work? Yeah. Um, Here's a calculation on a matrix uh, multiplication here of 649 by 649 for 20,000 iterations. Um, why is this why is this working? Well, I mean, on top of the advantage of having this runtime information, we can actually, if you want, inline or rewrite library functions as well. Um, the amount of benefit that you get uh, will vary a lot based on what library you're working with and how well it's been optimized uh, over the years. Um, but others with lots of functionality might be uh, better if they are optimized for the one use case that you need. Uh, but here's a graph of performance results from the code uh, in a case study. The case study is linked in the notes as per usual. Uh, and uh, the diagram has two parts to it that gives us some... Uh, explanation but basically the original version takes about two seconds to execute and they tried a few different techniques uh, for uh, taking that code and recompiling it to be better and swapping it in uh, and all of the ones that they tried worked traded off against uh, different uh, different costs for actually doing the analysis and the recompilation uh, dbrew takes the least time to actually re rewrite and optimize, but of course it produces results that are not as good as, say, dbrew LLVM, where it took more time to uh, actually rewrite and optimize, but results in better runtime performance. So there is a significant cost uh, associated with you know, the process of recompiling that segment of the program, uh, and how much benefit you will get out of it will depend on how often that segment of the program runs. Uh, but you know, if uh, if this is going to happen frequently, uh, then the uh, trade-off uh, of rewriting and optimization time, you know, in the order of ten to the minus two seconds, so that's really not very much time at all. Uh, could yield potentially very large benefits uh, in the actual execution of the updated program over time. So given the right workload, this is definitely worth doing. There's only one more problem. Program sus. Okay. It's worth noting that programs that rewrite themselves are frequently judged as suspicious by antivirus and anti-malware software. How did this happen? Well, the story behind it is part of what is effectively an arms race uh, between uh, virus writers, you know, malicious code authors, and antivirus, anti-malware authors who are trying to fight it. It starts with the first viruses, or viri. They are malicious code doing malicious things. All right, uh, they're bad. No one likes them. So antivirus software is developed to detect viruses and well, the primary mechanism that a lot of uh, antivirus software uses to determine whether or not it is a virus or not is based on comparing the binary code under examination uh, against a database of known malicious software. So uh, the arms race begins. To combat this, uh, some viruses alter themselves in subtle ways uh, or produce code that is functionally equivalent but looks different in binary than the original. Um, you know, your standard computer virus that causes havoc is not usually something that needs excellent performance, but making a trans uh, transformation that is slower at runtime but looks different to the virus scanner is fine, from the villain point of view at least. Uh, and it's impossible to predict all possible transformations for a particular piece of software because there's a lot of routes to the same destination. Antivirus software can try to ignore things like inserted no-ops or pay no attention to variables X and Y being swapped and swapped back just to put some assembly instructions in here, uh, that sort of thing. But ultimately, exact matching is or fuzzy matching is limited. 
So the next evolution in the approach for identifying whether something is a virus is based on heuristic analysis, which is to say, I want to take a look at what is the behavior of the program? What things is it doing? You know, is it poking around in operating system directories? Is it doing anything else that looks strange and or suspicious? Uh, and if so, then the virus scanner will say, I think this is potential malware and I don't want to let it run. So does its behavior look suspicious? Uh, and combining those things that we know, um, well, any program, even you know, a benign one, that changes its own binary code will probably be judged as suspicious uh, from the point of view of anti-malware software. And you can see why. It's a way that you know, a malicious program could change itself, you know, avoid the virus scan when it's being downloaded, and then do terrible things once it's actually uh, installed in your system. So uh, that might mean that uh, it'll be detected as a virus and not allowed to run, restricted in some way, something like that. Um, if you are determined you are going to rewrite the binary of your program, you should just keep in mind that you know, any anti-malware software that end users have installed may affect the experience if you're in fact shipping to end users at all. If you're running it on your own systems, uh, then you're not as worried about this being a concern. However, you know, program, uh, you don't want your program to be uh, voted out the airlock because you know, its behavior is suspicious, do you? <laughs>